ethics, morals, and everything into this church. So the church really started to take the shape of and the thought process and the morals and values and ethics of the culture and then sort of Christianized it. And so they ran into all kinds of problems. So Paul writes back to them the letter of 1 Corinthians and then subsequently the letter of 2 Corinthians. But if you look at the church of Corinth, I think you'll find a ton of similarities to the church of America. In fact, I think the church of America may not only be in as difficult a spot as the church of Corinth, we may be in a far worse spot. And so I think it's a very, very important study for us to walk through and ask in our own lives, in what ways are we shaped or molded by the culture rather than by Christ. And so the church of Corinth had all kinds of problems, fighting, division, they were suing one another, they were tolerating even the most grievous sexual sins and then even boasting about how tolerant they were and accepting those things. They were getting drunk even when they came together as a church, they were rejecting the distinct roles of men and women. There was all kinds of things happening at that church that Paul writes this letter to and said, and, and it's a letter that's pretty forceful, not as forceful as the letter of to the Galatians, but it's very forceful. He starts off, as we saw in chapter one, really encouraging them that he's giving thanks at all times for them because of their position in Christ. And then he subsequently says, and we have the wisdom of God. And we're going to build on that in chapter two today, dealing with what is true spirituality. Because Paul was pointing them back to what true spirituality was in a day where, in fact, that town, that city of Corinth was hyper-spiritual. And I think if we look at our culture, we would say it's hyper-spiritual. That is, everybody claims to be spiritual. Madonna claims to be spiritual. And in fact, her goal is to bring down the barrier between religion and sexuality because spirituality really for her is, is very sexual in nature, very much like the Corinthians. Remember, they had a temple there and they had a thousand shrine prostitutes and that was part of worship. And uh, uh, another Rain Wilson, a star from The Office, one of uh, Alex's favorite shows, can't say I've watched it, but anyways... Um, he says the highest form of spirituality is art, is art. That's the highest form of spirituality because that's where you can do the greatest good for other people, was his comment. Denzel Washington says for him spirituality, he says, I read the Bible every day and I read my, the daily word. Pretty interesting. But if you look around, everyone thinks they're spiritual, right? If they do yoga, they think they're spiritual. If they drink spring water, they think they're spiritual, right? If, they, uh, if they're for the environment or the recycle, they think they're spiritual. If they're a good person, they give to charities or care for animals, they probably think they're spiritual. If they are tolerant towards and supportive of the LGBTQ plus whatever agenda, they consider themselves spiritual. Uh, in churches, spirituality depends on what type of church you're going to, right? For some churches, if you speak in tongues, you're spiritual. For others, it's how much scripture you memorize that makes you spiritual. For others, it's how energetic and passionate your worship service is that makes you spiritual. For still others, it's how traditional and doctrinal your worship experience is that makes you spiritual. For still others, they think they're spiritual because they're single, and others think they're spiritual because they're married. So today we're going to look at what spirituality, that spirituality is fundamentally something God does in us, not fundamentally something we do. And when God does that work in us, there are things that work out, that work themselves out spiritually in true spirituality. And so while we live in a culture much like Corinth where everyone is hyper-spiritual, Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? He didn't mean, will I find spirituality on the earth? That is this hyper sense of what is, our culture might call spirituality. He meant genuine, authentic faith, Right? And so Paul's focus is really in this, in this chapter on the focus is on the Holy Spirit, specifically God, how God uses the word of God to ch change fundamentally somebody on the inside to make them truly spiritual. And so Paul's going to bring a message here in chapter 2 uh, about what true spirituality is wrought by God inside a person's life to, to a people who are bombarded with all kinds of other messages like you and I. Tomorrow, you're going to hear all kinds of messages. You might not think of them as sermons, but they're sermons nonetheless. You're going to kick on the radio, and depending on what station you kick on, there's all kinds of messages, sermons, right? 
You're going to hear advertisements, which are messages, they're sermons, if you will, about what's valuable, what will make your life valuable. You're going to hear all kinds of messages all the time from a culture that's hyper-spiritual about really what a meaningful life is. And then there's a message from God. And we're going to see today that God's message is the antithesis of everything the world is telling us. But what Corinth did was they took the world's message and they candy-coated it with God's message. So they made it sound real spiritual when it was just like the world. Their values, morals, and everything were just like the world. So we're in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, We're in chapter 2 and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. And he says this in verse 1. And when I come, came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hmm. And Abraham alluded to these things this morning as we sang to the Lord. But Paul was like, man, I didn't come be, and, and present this because I had the highest IQ. He says, I didn't come and present this in some hyper-passionate way. And so, so that I would sort of like, man, I'm going to convince you. He says, I'm just bringing you truth from God. Do you know the Puritans often would, some of them, went so far the other way that they tried to just simply read through their sermons and remove any passion out of it so that they wouldn't convince people to buy into it. Simply, here's the truth. Do you believe that, right? Now, we're on the other side of that, right? Smoke and light shows, doing everything, man. You got to believe, you know. And we have this, this drawing, like, hey, let's use everything possible to draw people and to get them to believe this stuff. Hmm. You know, the interesting thing about how God works is it's so basic and so simple that it gets missed among all of the busyness. He says, I didn't come with superior speech or wisdom. He wasn't a great speaker, the Apostle Paul. In fact, like Jesus, he really wasn't even much to look at. Now, we don't have a description of what he looked like, but it most uh, certainly was not like Brad Pitt, right? History tells us, not the Bible, but history tells us he was a fairly short, bald guy that was fairly bow-legged because of all the beatings he took. You say, no, wait a minute. I want to follow more attractive people than that, right? This is what it says of Jesus in Isaiah 53. He has no stately form or majesty that we would look upon him, nor appearance that we would be attracted to him. Jesus was not an attractive guy. He was... Mm -hmm beyond ordinary, right? And you know what? Paul was the same. Talk about no glamour, no Brad Pitt, none of these things, just basic. In fact, God, the way that God works is often so that when you're chasing all of the stuff that God of the world's views and all that makes it attractive, God says, I'm not in those things. So we need to be a bit careful, don't we? Um, he, says, he says basically, I'm not cool. I don't speak all that well. He's not a good-looking guy. Neither was Jesus. But he says, I have one message. I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus and him crucified. So he says, he comes to Corinth. He says, man, you got messages about everything. You guys have, you guys are on every topic. He says, I only have have one. I have one topic. I'm not cool. If you know pastors, they're not cool, right? We drive beater cars, read books too much, the whole nine yards. He's not cool. He doesn't speak very well. He doesn't look very cool. And he comes in and he says, uh, apart from, you know, he's like, you got all these messages. I got one. Jesus and him crucified. That's it. That's the summation of everything in creation can be culminated in Jesus and him crucified. Everything in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation culminates in that one act. Jesus and him crucified and rising from the grave is the greatest act of God that mankind has ever or will ever see. So you look at it and say, I have one message. You say, well, what about marriage? What about talking about stewardship? What about talking about kids? Talk about those things all in regards to and tethered to Jesus and him crucified. If you untether your message from Jesus and him crucified, you don't have the message of the Bible. Everything tethers to Jesus and him crucified. Everything. Everything. It's the central message of everything that God has done. In fact, it's the pre- premier thing. In 1 Corinthians, in the same book, in chapter 15, verse 3, says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to 
the scriptures. So he says, I have one message, Jesus and crucified. You say, well, I've got kids. Uh, I got a newborn already throwing fits, screaming, hollering, everything. What am I to do with that? Jesus and crucified. Came out a sinner, need Jesus. I got marriage problems. I'm in conflict. What do I need? Jesus and crucified. You need to know that God has made you right before him so that you can go and forgive and show grace and show love, right? I got money issues. They're just gospel issues. Go back to Jesus and crucified. If this is what God has done to save mankind, now everything we do falls under that category of making much of him, right? It's just Jesus and him crucified, right? It's Jesus came here to die for our sins, reconcile us to God, and made us new people. Everything goes back to that. We're new people in Christ, having been reconciled to God through the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul says, that's my only message, man. I got this one pony show, right? Everything goes back to that one message. Hmm. Well, he goes on in verse 3. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and power. He, he says in the same breath, basically, he's like, I came in weakness, in trembling. This guy took a beating, right? And then took a beating, and then took a beating. So what would you look like, what would Brian look like if the last three weekends he went different places and every weekend got flogged and beat? When he came in this morning... Might he be a little bit frail, a little bit like, if he then came in and said, and I'm here to present the power of God, would you laugh at him or believe him? Because that's what happened with Paul, right? He says, I came in with much fear and trembling. I've been beaten time and time again, and I'm here to present power. All the charlatans out there, if you turn on channel 14, there's many of them. We're about power. Fly in jets and buy Lamborghinis and we're about power. Paul says, he comes in after beaten, beaten, beaten. He says, I'm about power. He say, I think we got something different about what you're perceiving power and me perceiving power. He says, you bet you. My power comes from a kingdom that's coming soon. That's already redeemed me and placed me as a citizen in that kingdom. My power comes from the fact that I'm unstoppable. And so even if you kill me, the message keeps going. My power comes from the fact that I've been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment of my inheritance with the kingdom in God's kingdom. And I'm going to meet the king. And my power comes from the fact that you can't do anything about that. And so what we perceive to be power and our soul, the bill of goods at times, this is what power is. It'd be good to go back and ask Paul, who was weak beaten, frail, and says, I'm about power. Because maybe that's different than it's how it's presented. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> he says, he was with them on all this weakness, but demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. He was like, man, don't rest any of, you know, do not say, okay, hey, you said it, it's, it's good as gold, right? Hey, don't rest any faith on what men tell you. We live in a day even where pastors in some churches are like, you're anointed, that means you're right there with God and his word. That's baloney. There's only the word of God that's authoritative. To any degree that I or anyone else get off, we are not telling you what God said. It is only the word of God. And that's the only lasting thing and the only right thing and the only pure thing. And any deviation from that thing is a deviation from what God's like. And you know what? Unfortunately, we like to deviate, don't we? We like to say the opposite of God and then worship him. You remember back in Genesis 3 when mankind fell into this whole mess to begin with? God said, don't eat of what? The fruit. Satan comes along and says, has he really said don't eat the fruit? That's just so ridiculous. That's so simplistic. That you know, it's very wise to eat the fruit. Actually, what he meant was the exact opposite. Like, if you eat the fruit, you'll be wise. You eat the fruit, you'll be better off. You eat the fruit, that's actually really good. What'd she do? Eve ate the fruit. First Timothy 2 says, being quite deceived. She believed it was a good thing to eat the fruit. Adam was far more corrupt in his heart. He was just lazy and spiritual, a little apathetic, and just went along with it. And he gets hung with that for the rest of Scripture, doesn't he? But the fact is, that's modern Christianity. You take what God said, flip it around, say the exact opposite, and then go, we worship you for being 
what he isn't. Because we rest our faith on the wisdom of what? Men. That was Corinth. Like they switched the story up, agreed with culture, thought that was better, Christianized it, and then worshiped God. For all things he was not. That's the essence of heresy, isn't it? That's the essence of heresy. Well, he goes on. Verse 6, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. The term mature there really speaks to those who are saved because it's in contrast to unbelievers. A wisdom, however, not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Verse 7 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eyes have not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So you go, man, praise God. Some people use this thing. Man, you can't even envision all that God has in store for you. Look at this verse. But if you read the next one, for to us God has revealed them through the Spirit. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this amazing, miraculous thing happened that God in his infinite wisdom revealed his mind to his people, that to a world, look at that and they say, that's utter foolishness. And God says, that's exactly right. But to you, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Huh. Hmm. You see, the word of God preached... Um, should be the word of God and not the opinions of men. Should be the word of God and not the opinions of men. And where the word of God disagrees with the opinions of men, which it does everywhere, you've got to decide who you're going to stick with. Because in Corinth, they decided to go with the opinions of men and then Christianize them. And I'm afraid that happens far too often. And so, what you hear in the church is absolutely, completely opposite to what you hear in the world. Or it should be. It should be. Because what Paul is saying is that non-Christians don't think like Christians. They work from a human perspective, not from God's perspective. And as a result, you have a completely different worldview. That is, they view God themselves and their lives in a completely different way than Christians do. So outside the church, the world leads on man's wisdom, from psychologists to counselors to politicians to activists to talk show hosts like Dr. Phil and Oprah, right? If you take college classes, you're going to learn what? In psychology, you're going to learn how to improve the world by improving individuals, right? If you take sociology, you learn human perspective on how to improve your community. If you study anthropology in college, you'll learn how to understand other cultures and the human perspective. You take philosophy, you'll understand all kinds of other human ideologies. And then you step into the church and you hear you're a condemned sinner that needs saved. And you're like, I never heard that in any one of those classes that they ever taught me. And you say, I know. Because what God is saying is the complete opposite to everything the world's saying. The complete opposite. No, 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 no. I just heard how good I am, how great I am, how amazing the the human experience and how great we are. And then I went to church and I heard the exact opposite. Well, praise God. It probably was from God then. Because if you heard the same thing, you should have great question. Like, wow, the whole world could essentially agree with that. That would be an issue, right? That would be an issue. And so so when you look at it, the church and God's wisdom and God's solution for all things is what? The cross. Every single issue that we've got in life has its solution in the cross of Jesus Christ, is what Paul's saying. The problem for the Corinthians was they allowed man's wisdom to come in, candy coat it, and they basically rejected God's wisdom, and accepted a dying, decaying, foolish wisdom of this world that's passing away. But you know what? As we sit here today, there's a very good chance that all of us have areas where we're resting our faith on the the wisdom of men. On the wisdom of men. 
And it perhaps in those areas would be very offensive for us to think otherwise. To think otherwise. Hmm. And yet he goes on, he says, for the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Verse 11, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. In other words, I don't know what Brian's thinking right now. And he doesn't know what I'm thinking. Except I'm talking, so maybe he has some idea. But the fact is, you have no idea what somebody else is thinking. And you had no idea what God's thinking. Except this, that God decided to tell you what he's thinking. He decided to tell you what he's thinking. And you know what most think? I'm really not interested in your thoughts, God, because I got my own. I got my own. And so I was reading about the religious philosophies of those who are are running for a nominee for our president, as well as our current president. And so you have on Trump's side, you have his, he has a, a lady who's his pastor, that buys in the prosperity gospel. And on the the Democratic nominee side, you have many that call themselves progressive. I was reading about one. And they said, well, I'm not really Christian. My wife is. I go to church and we celebrate. and We we hang the the gay pride banners and we celebrate a God of tolerance. And that's pretty typical, isn't it? So you either celebrate a God who's like, it's all about me and it's all about health, wealth, prosperity, or you celebrate a God, it's like, it's all about the morals and ethics. Come to find out, God thinks just like us. And you say, man, you keep telling yourself that. And it won't go well for you. Because that's exactly been the mankind's issue since Genesis 3. God says one thing, we flip it over, we say the exact opposite, and then we go, man, let's lift our hands in praise for, for the greatness of God's tolerance that he accepts all people and will save all people. you like, put your hands down. You see, the truly spiritual have had something happen within them of the spirit of God because they have agreed and looked upon God and believed him when it runs a contrary to everything that mankind believes. Mm. You see, only the Spirit of God makes us spiritually alive and directs us in the Spirit to what God says as though it's true and wise. And so only God knows what God's thinking, right? And yet he shares it. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. So God says, you know what? I'm going to just go ahead and tell them what I'm thinking. I'll freely give it to them. I'm going to tell them what I'm thinking. That would be cool, wouldn't it? If the one and only true and living God who made all things decided to tell you what he's thinking. But would you care? Would I care? We can ask ourselves that by looking at how important what he said is to us. Like, do we hunger? Like David, he says, I long for you. Like, like, a, like a, a deer longs and pants for water, so my soul longs for you. Look at, you look at Psalm 119, 176 verses, and all but two are extolling, like, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. Like, he's just like, I received the mind of God, and I just love that he revealed his mind to me, and it's contrary to everything this world is thinking. It's true, by the way, in every generation and in every culture that what God thinks is the exact opposite of what man thinks. Hmm. He says, verse 13, for the things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thought with spiritual words. So we talk completely different, right? In the world you hear about what? Self-love, self-esteem, bipolar, you know, addiction. And and basically what you hear is you're kind of stuck, but we'll give you medication. It's not your fault. Then you go to church and you hear sin, idolatry, and a need for repentance and forgiveness for restoration so that you don't have to go, "I'm I'm an addict. You go, I'm free in Christ. It's completely different. God's thoughts are forward-looking. The world is backward-looking. And you say, we combine spiritual thoughts, the mind of God, with spiritual words, sanctification, justification, redemption, all these things that God spoke to us. We say, we receive that. The world's saying, no, 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 no. 
use all of our lingo to describe what you're doing. We say, no, we reject man's wisdom. We only accept God's wisdom. Hmm. But the natural man, verse 14, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. So what is he saying? He says, this makes absolutely no sense to somebody outside of Christ, right? No sense. And so what we do is we turn it around, like we use that illustration, and say, man, we are celebrating and worshiping a God of tolerance, a God who made everybody and made them homosexual and lesbian and all that. You go, wait a minute. God made us beautifully from different, we all have different backgrounds. We can all trace it back to uh, our one parents, Adam and Eve. All races go back to Adam and Eve. So we're all the same race, right? Human race. And yet there's a beauty in the different backgrounds, and we can celebrate those things, and we should. But it's not like God made some this race and some that race and some bisexual. Those are sins, right? It's not like some God made some, some white and some Asian and some meth heads. No, no, no. You're, you're talking about different things. Okay. Meth head is a sin issue, and being white or Asian is a race, you know, that God made. So we, we try to spin it all up into a ball, and, and you go, no, no, God made a male and female. You see, we got to, God's wisdom is not like man's wisdom. And so what we need to do is say, what does God say? Because in like chapter one, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And he skips down uh, after totally rejecting God. It says, therefore God gave them over to the lust of their heart to impurity so their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading, degrading passions. Women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, men abandon the natural function of women and burn their desire towards one another. And he just goes on and you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need to like listen to the word of God. Because Everyone out there has got a spin on it from a human perspective. And I'm not telling you to listen to me. I'm telling you to go back to the word of God. And all the way since Genesis 3, when he says, don't eat the fruit, it, it, it's, it's like modern Christianity would say, come on in, eat the fruit, don't eat the fruit. It doesn't matter. It only matters you love God. And you go, let me, let me get this straight. So God says, don't eat the fruit. It may be really good to eat it. It may be really good not to eat it, but it really doesn't matter. It just matters I love God. Is that right? totally right. Let's lift our hands and praise. You say, wait a minute. That plummeted us into death and destruction. That's why every one of us see the inside of a casket. This is big time, right? Maybe we're playing around with a God who doesn't play. Maybe we're re reorienting what he said to fit what we think and man's wisdom rather than just taking what he said, believing he said it, and then moving forward. Yeah. You know, I was reading a quote-unquote theologian this morning, and they said, you know our problem is? We, we've messed this up, and we believe that Jesus' death on a cross was for atonement or redemption to buy us out of sin. They're like, we need to get away from that. We need to scrap that altogether. That's not it. What that does is people who believe that start to elevate people above creation. And as a result, we don't treat the world ethically. And this theologian was saying, actually, everyone's getting in because look at the parable of Jesus and the father. I mean, the father and the prodigal son, he welcomes the son back. And Jesus would never, ever have have to atone for it. God is merciful, lets everyone in, lets all animals in. You want to treat the world morally and ethically, we've got to get away from this whole idea of atoning sacrifice. You say, man, that's crazy, right? What I'm saying is, be careful. Be prayerful. We go back to the word of God because a lot of what we're thinking may be like the Corinthian believers. It may actually be human wisdom that we're banking on. There was a big explosion between Mar um, John MacArthur and Beth Moore uh, back in October when MacArthur had brought up this. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly. Um, he says, uh, verse 12 of 1 Timothy 2, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Maybe you won't come back next week. But I'm here to tell you it'd be worth thinking about. Like if he says don't eat the fruit, 
Does he mean eat it or not eat it? This theologian this morning took the obvious passages about the redemption of man and threw them out and replaced them with parables that Jesus taught to disprove what Jesus said. To say that Jesus didn't come to pay for your sins, that's absurd. God's going to show mercy and there's universal salvation. We need to believe that so we can treat the world ethically. And that is a so-called theologian who has studied deeply. Be careful. I'm saying that there's all kinds of deception and at the same time, globally, there's all kinds of true and authentic believers and great churches all around the globe that are really believing that what he said is true and sticking with it. And so the more I read some of the craziness out there, the more concerned that I look at Corinth and I say, they may have been in a good spot compared to the church in America. He says, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. So here's the idea. It's not that, man, nobody can judge me, because you know what Paul will do in the same letter? He'll make some judgment calls. In 1 Corinthians 5, he comes and says, you should have made this judgment call. You should have thrown this guy who's sleeping and having sex with his stepmom. You should have thrown him out of the church. You should have turned him over Satan, but you actually thought you were so tolerant that you kept him around. He's like, that tolerance is worldly wisdom. I'm talking about God's wisdom. I'm turning him over Satan. You say, wait a minute. That's God's wisdom? That's God's wisdom. Way different than man's wisdom. So he's not saying that we can't be judged by the word of God. Actually, the word of God judges all things. He who is spiritual praises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. And so Paul... Hey, the point is, Paul is judging the church. He's judging the people in the church, and he's calling them, them to make a judgment call in regards to other members who are sinning, and yet, it's subject to the right kind of judgment. So many times we make the wrong judgments, right? We judge for the wrong reasons and instead of the right ones, or we make judgment calls, and we listen to judgment calls by the world. He says, I don't take into consideration anything the world has to say. See, we listen to the world, and the world says, listen, never talk about religion or spirituality. And we go, wow, that's, that's wise. Okay, so I won't talk about wisdom or spirituality. They're like, wait a minute, that's the world's wisdom. Jesus said, speak up, go proclaim it. The reason that Paul looks so terrible is because it wasn't very acceptable in that day. It would be like, let's send Giovanni out to Katie comes back next week, beaten, bruised, they nearly killed him. Doesn't look like Katie was accepting of that message. Let's hold a Paraland the next weekend. Gets beaten, bruised, nearly dies again, comes back. Apparently Paraland wasn't that favorite. You know, we don't have to deal with that. It was so much more hostile towards the gospel back then. And yet we take the world's wisdom and say, if we are just, if we keep it to ourselves, back up, be cool. You're, I don't mind your Christianity as long as it's just yours. Don't share it with me. Don't tell him. And we say, I'll, I'll listen to that. I'll receive that. Don't receive it. We don't listen to the world's wisdom. We're not judged by the world. We're judged by God. We're judged based on God's wisdom, not the world's. And a lot of times the church receives the judgments from the world and rejects the world judgments from God's wisdom. So be careful. What I, what I sense is that in Corinth, everything was upside down. And they were unaware. Sometimes in our own life, we get it upside down and we're unaware. And that isn't to say God didn't love them. He did love them. And that's why he was telling them these things. And so he says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the most supernatural thing that you can ever, ever conceive of. That God, who only knows his mind, nobody else knows his mind, and nobody's going to give him instruction, and he's never asked for it, and he never will. Do you know how much instruction he wants from you? Zip, zilch, none. You know the greatest and smartest and wisest people who have ever lived, God didn't want one iota, one small bit of counsel for them. He said, I don't need any counsel from you, and any degree that you think you're going to counsel me shows the corruption in your heart. Because in Isaiah 40, he says, my understanding is inscrutable. When they were complaining, going, you didn't get this right. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. I raise up nations. I bring them down. 
rulers, the greatest and most powerful men on this earth are like that to me. I, I watch them come. I watch them go. What's the big deal? He says, my understanding is inscrutable. Are you really going to trust me? Will you trust him if what he is saying here seems the exact opposite of everything else everyone's saying? That's the essence of faith. That's the essence of faith. That's why when you walk into a church and you go, like, this is so different than everything on TV. This is so different than everything in college. This is so different than everything on, a, on Dr. Phil and Oprah. This is so different than everything everybody's saying. And you say, yeah, God's wisdom is very different than that. And so we have the mind of Christ. So the, the question becomes, if we've been given the ability to see as God sees, to think like God thinks, to feel like God feels, then we should be saying, God, not, you know, not like in a Genesis 3 type thing, has he really said. We need to be saying, if that's true, like don't eat the fruit. Like, I may not understand why not to eat the fruit, right? But I can understand, like, okay, if you said that and you're wiser and smarter and more holy than me, like, that's the right thing to do. And I need to keep doing the right thing by faith until I understand the right thing, why it's the right thing, or I meet Jesus and then I'll know it's the right thing. And so you and I need to say... God, we need to get with him each day in the word, and we need to say, God, our tendency is self-deception. Our tendency, going all the way back to Genesis 3, is to take what you said, flip it upside down, and worship you for the exact opposite that you are. And we need to prayerfully go, God, am I doing that in any way? And I want to repent of that. And I want to get people around me that can help point that out. It's kind of like, it runs the gamut, right? The scripture says, the rod and reproof bring correction to your children. But you can find Christians all day long go, Ma, I tried that, I don't use the rod. What are they saying? I think man's wisdom is better. I, they, they say, well, you know, the word of God is sufficient, but really I'm going to go to my psychologist to, to figure these things out because I think man's wisdom is better. The question is, the truly spiritual are those who have the spirit and dwell them, who look upon the word of God and say, you said don't eat the fruit. I'm going to keep believing and obeying till I understand. Or till I see you face to face and I will fully understand in that moment. You see, faith is taking God at his word and not twisting, not distorting, and not relying on human wisdom. And if, if the people, and, it, and it's because it's all tethered to the cross of Jesus Christ. So if, if people you're listening to don't tether it to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to listen to different people. Because Jesus and him crucified and resurrected is the only hope for your rebellious kids. And Jesus and him crucified is the only hope for your marriage. And Jesus and him crucified is the only hope for your eternity. And Jesus and him crucified is the only hope for your forgiveness. And Jesus and him crucified is the only hope for your healing from the sins done against you. And Jesus and him crucified is the only hope for mankind. In a dead and dying world where human wisdom will one day be destroyed, only thing that survives is God and his wisdom and those who would put their faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? God specifically sent people who didn't look like Brad Pitt. And he specifically sent people who didn't have much eloquence and didn't have much gifting and didn't have a great IQ and didn't have what the world wants. And they simply cried out and said, there's a God and he's way different than everyone's telling you. Do you believe it? And most said, nah. Uh, nah. No. And occasionally someone would say, I believe that. Because uniquely, I sense that I've wronged him in a deep way. And if he'll forgive me and not treat me like I treated everybody else, I will come and follow him and whatever he says goes. And you say, amen, come with me. I'm going to a kingdom that's not of this world. I'm going to meet a king who rules this world, even though it doesn't look like it. And I'm going to go spend forever with him. Come with me. It's going to be amazing. But know this, if you come along, you may get beaten. If you come along, you may lose your family. If you come along, you may lose your job. If you come along, you may lose your life. So you make sure you count the cost before you go follow Christ because he doesn't play. Let's pray.